mysterious death curse washes over the land, driven by a powerful artifact known as the Soulmonger. Four would-be heroes have been sent to the jungles of Chult to destroy the cause of this terrible affliction. Veil, the half-elven paladin, who's just now learning of his divinely granted powers. Ubo, the total monk from a distant land, who's as quick with his wit as he is with his staff. Asimar Warlock, sent on this quest by her temple, discovering herself in this strange new land. And Gunslinger Cole, tiefling artificer and archaeologist who may just dig up more than she bargained for. This motley band of adventurers must work together to brave the poisonous plants, venomous monsters, thundering dinosaurs, and rotting undead of the jungle. Join the omnipotent dungeon master. Jake for many to name the way to see if our heroes can find the soul longer, uncover the deeper mysteries of Chelt, and free the world from the death curse. Welcome to the jungle. Welcome to Chelt of Personality. Hey, Internets, it's Jake from Mini Terrain Domain, and this is Chult. Of personality episode 42 a den of vipers in our long-running tomb of annihilation campaign happening every sunday night right here on twitch.tv slash mini terrain domain it's been a month since we got this group together to play um just dealing with the usual uh trying to get everybody together on Sunday nights. And then of course we had Jasper's stream week, which uh, delayed everything by a week, but we're all here and we are ready to play some D and D in the jungles of Chult. A couple of announcements really quickly. One, I just mentioned, mentioned Jasper's game day. Jasper's game day is a, uh, and mini terrain domain are uh, partnered together um, to raise awareness and funds for uh, suicide prevention. There is a link here on Twitch down below in the banners below the stream, uh, specifically that says Jasper's Game Day. You can click on that and get more information. Um, if at any time during this stream or any time ever, you find yourself struggling and in need of somebody to talk to, you can simply type exclamation point, point ex excuse me, exclamation point help in our chat. That is a permanent chat command that brings up the National Suicide Hotline. Do not hesitate to call that number if you need somebody to talk to. There are trained professionals standing by at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255, or you can text... 741741. Please remember that. We'll probably hit that a couple more times. Um, but, and also do check out Jasper's Game Week, or excuse me, Jasper's Game Day. A great organization. Uh, Mini Terrain Domain will be doing many more things throughout the year um, and in the future with that organization. Speaking of Jasper's Game Day and Mini Terrain Domain and partnerships, I have also partnered with initiative coffee company to bring you a metade roast coffee from initiative coffee company it is a brazilian and peruvian roast in partnership with mtd and initiative coffee company the roast supports jasper's game day uh for every 12 ounce bag of beans or grind grounds of coffee purchased from Initiative Coffee Company of the Metade Rose. Three dollars of that goes directly to benefit Jasper's Game Day and their efforts. Uh, that that money, in case people ask, goes to fund crisis centers around the country in association with the American Association of Suicidology. Um, obviously, it's something that's very important to me. A very important message. Uh, so those are the primary partnerships you will hear about. Now, in case you may be wondering why there are some devil faces below me, if you are new to the stream, or as a reminder, these are what we call domain dice, or in this case, for this game, we call them domain devils. Every time you donate $5 or 500 bits to the channel, 
that purchases one domain die or domain devil. Uh, we also award those for raids, resubscriptions, and those kind of things, uh, and initial subscriptions to the channel. What these domain dice do, you can learn by typing in the phrase domain dice in the chat, or you can watch the scroll going along the bottom. They basically allow the players at any time to spend a domain devil and re-roll a d20. Spend two domain devils and re-roll, or rather force me to re-roll a d20. Or there's other things all the way up to five domain dice, the patron's blessing to turn a hit into an automatic super crit dealing two times max damage. I do believe that pretty much sums up the announcements that I have. Uh, we will have some more. We're going to take a break right around the 10 o'clock hour. Um, and there will be uh, a video that has other announcements and uh, things, other things going on in the channel. So you can check that out then. Until then, thank you to everybody who has tuned in. Once again, Megan taking advantage of that uh, self-funding the <laughs> the domain dice uh but i do appreciate resubscribing to the channel uh so that gets you guys another one you are at eight which means if somebody has a critical fail of a death saving throw you can spend all of these domain dice to bring them uh turn that into a success um not saying that that's going to be necessary or anything but we'll see what happens um all right i'm gonna do the recap since it has been a month since we played um i'm not going to take a point of inspiration for it um but we're going to just get a little refresher on what happened previously in Cholt of personality most recently the group of adventurers had been making their way through the lost city of omu uh having encountered the remnants of a battle with the yanti and Berlinia's, uh, the organization Berlinia once belonged to, known as the Weeping Friars. The scribe uh, of who had partnered with or was working with the, um, the Weeping Friars, a man by the name of uh, Orv Orvrex, I think was his name. Um, I quickly flipped through and tried to remember what his name was. Orvex Okramas um, gave them a little bit of information that... The friars and the auntie were searching for puzzle cubes in some temples. Berlinia and Vale headed off to search one of the temples while Kualu and Dunala headed off to the northeast on a mission. And they actually initially, uh, there was another member of the party who had headed off in that direction, tried to fight a couple of the Weeping Friar Warlocks and the poor bird uh, was feeble-minded and flew off into the sunset. But Dunala's longtime friend and one-time guardian of his daughter, uh, Kualu, showed up and partnered with everybody. Then Kuala, nope, Kualu and Dunala, uh, that's how I ship them, is Kuala. Uh, that's their couple name. Um... They headed off to the, the city itself, to the, to the palace. Vale and Berlinia encountered one of Ubtau's um, uh, trickster god manifestations in the form of uh, Kubazan, the Frogamoth, and very nearly did not survive that encounter. Um, it was a close one. Uh, eventually, everybody made their way towards the palace through one way or another, um, everybody finding the way a secret entrance into the underground entrance to the temple. Kualu, Kualu and Dunala had picked up a, uh, an older female tabaxi by the name of Copper Bells, who was looking for an honorable death and had come to the city seeking such and had partnered up with them and very nearly got it when they encountered a hydra in the underground river. But... The Hydra was eventually scared away by a naked Dunala and Kualu, uh, who eventually re-robed, um, while Berlinia and Vale, having narrowly escaped from some spellbound uh, Yanti uh, that were very poor shots. Um, word has it they were known as the Stormtrooper Legion of 
the Yanti because they couldn't hit anything. Uh, eventually, um, they all found themselves in a uh, either partaking in or listening to an in-depth conversation between Dunala and Rosnasi, the leader of the Yanti, who himself is a appears as from the waist up as a man and from the waist down as a serpent but from the waist up he's also covered in bandages and sores uh and appears to be in a state of accelerated decay himself affected by the death curse that plagues the land but rosnesi was prepared for his encounter with dunala having been spying on dunala for a very long time previously and the rest of the party through their guide, Salida, who uh, was murdered by Dunala for her treachery uh, quite some time ago. So he knew to prepare, and he is accompanied by a couple of Yanti brood guards that carry golden staffs with a large orb suspended between them, which contains an enchanted beholder eye, the central eye, projecting a cone of anti-magic. Uh, which unfortunately affects everybody in the area. Eventually, uh, through very heated conversation, Rosnesi told Dunala that he had his daughter, uh, and you'll have to correct me if I'm mistaken, but I believe it's Adresnia. Um, Adesnia. Adesnia. Adesnia is, is Dunala's daughter, uh, who had slipped into a coma the last anybody had seen him, uh, seen her. Uh, but Rosnesi says that he has brought her here to the temple. Uh, this angered Dunala, but Rosnesi, um is keeping them all at bay, has brought them into, uh, into his audience chamber, where they are joined by uh, several Yanti Malisons, which are the Yanti that some of them have the snake heads and humanoid bodies. Some of them have humanoid uh, bodies with serpent uh, are hum humanoid upper halves with serpent bodies, and some of them have snakes for arms. Eventually, another woman joins them, looking just like Salida. They s except she also has the serpent body. They find out that she is Fenthaza, the uh, sister of Salida, and one who doesn't really care that Salida is dead. Another group of Yanti Malisons are brought in bearing a palanquin upon which lies clothed in a white silk dress the unconscious form of Adesnia, Dunala's daughter. And the last thing that happened as Dunala had climbed aboard the palanquin and held his unconscious daughter for a few moments. And then when he rose from the cushions... There was wetness left behind on her cheek from Dunala's tears. Dunala almost completely, com almost completing the transition back from Yanti to human under the influence of uh, the divine intervention of Ubtau. The last thing we saw was Adesnia, her eyes fluttering open tears streaking down her cheek and mixing with those of Dunala's on her face as she looks at him and says Papa so as a reminder in this audience chamber uh, that you are currently in and we are going to pick up at this exact moment um, you are in this audience chamber that is 30 feet wide and uh, is 40 feet long at the northern end of it is an iron throne in which Rosnesi has sort of coiled himself and is sort of draped more than seated in this iron throne. There are four co stone columns that are supporting the vaulted 20-foot ceiling. You have entered from a cave entrance to the right uh, that comes directly from the underground river. The southern edge of in the center of the wall on the southern edge is a alcove with a um, a circle engraved with runes standing on either side of this, holding the um, the staff, the staves between them. 
uh, with the magical beholder eye suspended and covering the entire room are the two Yanti brood guards. Flanking around the room are ten Yanti Malisons. The six that escorted Fenthaza into the room and then the four that came in bearing the palanquin, which now rests on the floor in the middle of the room, uh, directly in front of Dunala, Kualu, Berlinia, Vale, and Copper Bell, who has a look on her face uh, as much as you can interpret this uh, this feline humanoid's expression uh, very much like a cat that has just found itself in the very wrong place. Like, she's just looking around, seeing everything that's been unfolding, like, what in the nine hells did I get myself into? Uh, and then standing near the dais where the Iron Throne is, is Fenthaza. Adesnia's eyes have just fluttered up Dunala, fluttered open Dunala, and she says, Papa, before we get to your reaction, kind of covering the initial conversations and as this all unfolded, I would like to go to the others and see how they are all taking all of this in. Because for the most part, Vale, Berlinia, and Kualu were very passively observing all of this and just kind of going along. Uh, so Vale, just take us through this as you met up with everybody on the river, were transported to this throne room, and see now Dunala's daughter brought before him, um, and seeing the basically you are in the viper's nest um, of the Yanti. Uh, take us through Vale's thought process and, and where he's at. Sure. So, <clears throat> yeah, traveling uh, with these Yanti, uh, I, I would definitely be kind of a little bit, I would be extremely cautious. Uh, and I would be looking that I, I understand that there is a significance of why we are here. I could probably even see it in Dunala's face, or at least his outpouring of emotion. So yeah, normally that is very much, uh, that is very unlike Dunala. Uh, so this is obviously something that is important to him. And as such, uh, I am keeping, I'm keeping more of an eye on Dunala than I would be necessarily with the rest of the Yonti. Because if the Yonti really wanted us to die, they would have attacked us right away anyway. So I'm just kind of keeping more of an eye on Dunala. And, uh, and everything that is going on. And I think if things go south, then that'll be, I'll probably see it in Dunala's, Dunala's eyes before I see it uh, around me, so. Excellent. Berlinia. I think Berlinia is looking mostly at uh, Dunala's daughter, just with this face of, of concern and fear. She hasn't said a word on their way uh, traveling with the auntie. She's kind of not really uh, observant. Uh, she doesn't have that kind of um, expertise uh, to know what to look for or signs or anything like that. Um, but she is looking just to make sure that everything seems to be safe, at least for the moment. Excellent. Uh, give me, give me an insight. Berlinia. And if it works better for you, uh, you can add religion to that. I don't know if it does, but if it, if it plays in your favor, add your religion bonus instead of your insight bonus. Uh, so I got a 25. I actually rolled a crit. Oh, nice. So that doesn't change the fact that you Berlinia still really doesn't know what's going on, but you're picking up in the, the way the Yanti are presenting themselves, what you've seen once you entered into this, uh, from this underground river into what appears to be a um 
a Yanti temple of some sort. Just the way in the body language, the presentation and everything, you recognize aspects of it from all of your time with the Weeping Friars, that there is an underlying sense of hierarchy, an underlying sense of um, ceremony. Uh, everything points to the Yanti are presenting themselves in a very ritualistic um, manner uh, so that you, you feel that there's some, you don't know what it is, but you get the sense there's some sort of uh, religious ceremony that drives a lot of their uh, beliefs and actions. And with that high of a role, you're picking up subtle tension between Fenthaza and Rosna C. It's very subtle, um, but you've seen this play out with the Weeping Friars, with Brother Mateus and others that have been near his position of power, that there almost seems to be a sense of um, concealed jealousy. What about you, Kualu? This is Kualu. all... Dunala is your is your best friend, and you've seen all of this mm -hmm. play out, and you're seeing him affected in such a dramatic fashion. So, what is this doing to Kualu, who has only been reunited with uh, his his friend and his friend's associates uh, for a very short time? Kualu is next to Dunala. He has put his arm on Dunala's shoulder, his hand on his shoulder, uh, to comfort him. But the there's something a bit off about not his comfort towards Dunala, but Kualu's comfort in this scenario. He he is concerned. For the last time that he saw Dunala's daughter, it was back in Port Nyanzaru, but here she is here and now in the possession of Yanti. And this is what <clears throat> and Kualu has a suspicions turned towards the Yanti. If they're able to transport her daughter to have this kind of effect on Dunala, then what else do they have in store? And so Kualu is really just eyeing up very suspiciously of all the Yanti around him, waiting for them to strike as these treacherous uh, poison serpents do. So he has this other hand readied on his blade. Not drawing it, but just ready to show down. All right. And now Dunala. In light of everything that has happened, and now actually seeing your daughter in front of you, and now seeing her for the first time since you left her. Uh, hold on one second. One second, the stream got disconnected. Um, we're all frozen on... Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, we're all frozen on the stream. Um, I got a message that OBS had disconnected and is reconnecting. So let's just see. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. It looks like we're moving again. Oh, no. Hold on. All right, hold on one second. I'm showing that we're still streaming. See, that's weird because I'm looking at the stream right now and it's offline. Hmm. Yeah, stream offline. Son of a. All right, I don't know what happened. That's so weird. Um. Okay. I. Uh... I'm gonna have to take us off air for a minute through the OBS and. The good thing is my local recording is still recording. Oh, crazy. So uh, let's go back on air and see if it goes. Um, okay. Uh, that looks like it froze again. Okay, everybody in the chat, can you see us now? Uh, 
two socks five and skellington jr says they can see us back okay i do apologize for that interruption i'm not 100 percent sure if that was a glitch or it is possible that um right before that happened my when i moved my book as i was flipping through it um it bumped the keyboard so i might have somehow hit a hot key uh so i do apologize for that um we do appear to be back um i'm not sure exactly what the last thing everybody heard was um so we're gonna just back a little bit i think it was you would have heard of uh, uh kualu talk about it, what he had seen and so we were throwing it to um dunala uh to now that he has seen his daughter uh for the first time since he since uh before he left her she appears to be conscious um and is calling your name Dunala's eyes, um, golden, the pupils elongated, they sweep across the room as he slowly turns to look back into the palaquin to see his daughter. And he counts <clears throat> every single one T that's lining this entire chamber. He takes note of the position of where the beholder eye is and the two brood guards who are holding it. He sees Dasmia and he sees Rosna see upon his throne. He sees the positions of his friends, his allies, his best friend behind, right beside him, and he looks into your face, Kualu. And it's the briefest look, and I don't think even Kualu would know what emotion this new strange Dunala is feeling right now. After all, Kualu has no children of his own. But as Dunala turns to look back into the palaquin, he has counted every single threat in hand. And that's exactly how he sees them, as a literal den, a nest of vipers everywhere. Nothing but dangers to his daughter. Nothing but potential death. And with potential death comes complete obliteration by the soulmonger. And he remembers Cole. And the thoughts of Cole makes him think of Berlinia, and that makes him think of Vale, and again of their missing friend, Ieric. And finally, his eyes look back to his daughter. And his locks framing his face or shadowing it so you cannot see his expression. Only she can see it. And he sits on the edge of the bed that he is sitting on. And he says in Cholton to her, so only Kualu and maybe they all know if he has a magical power and they want to understand it. He says to her, were you dreaming sweet, my little Yakabito? She reaches a hand very tentatively, not out of necessarily fear or trepidation, but she is weak. The curse that affects her is you had already seen the gauntness um, lying below the surface, the sallow cheeks, her arms that appear to be a little more than skin and bone as she weakly tries to reach up towards you, uh, but her arm falls down, and she just looks at you and says, am I, am I dreaming now, Papa? And as her arm falls, Dinala actually catches her hand before it touches the bed, and he leans into her, so that way she can more clearly see him. And he says, yes, my little Yaka, you are. I knew you would be dreaming, and I came to visit you. It has been a very long time. I have much to show you. And as he is speaking, he can feel the thinness of her skin, the hollowness of the flesh, the rigidity of the bones, and his stomach is turning with nausea and disgust as he feels how sickly and weak that his daughter is. You hear a sort of a very faint, subtle, staccato sound of something shifting across metal as Rosna C slowly uncoils himself from his iron throne, the sound of his scales flicking across the metal of this throne with its five hydra heads carved in the iron, shaped into it, towering overhead, and he slides down the dais and closer on the other side of the palanquin. You see, Donala, 
I was not lying to you. I did not deceive you about your daughter. And even you can see how close she is to the door of death. Does she not look cared after, like I said she was? And Dunala's hands move to kind of cup Adesnia's ears so that they can't hear what she is saying or what he is saying. And he speaks to Ross and see without looking at him in the dialect of the ones here, that mixture of abyssal and draconic. And he says to him, puts her back to sleep. I will not talk to a monster such as you in front of her. He cocks his head. Yo, it is true. Now, in this light, and as a reminder, like the uh, the green flickering flame behind me, this whole room is illuminated um, by green flame torches. Even in the light of the temple, I can see but your serpentine nature has all but left you. It is your humanity and your emotions that now are taking control. I don't know how this is. I don't really care. But I can see that even though you now, Lunala, are more human than ever, you are tensed, coiled and poised, ready to strike. I would caution you against this. I will send your daughter away, back into the temple where she will be cared for. But as I said in the cave, if you do anything to me, she will die. Not by my hand, but you will damn her to death by this curse. I believe I told you, Nasi, and he's always careful, Dunala, to leave off the noble title of Raz. I will not talk to you until she is put back to sleep. He looks over at Finthaza. Take her away. Take her back to the chamber. Continue to watch over her. See that she is fed and bathed again. And then let her slumber some more. The four Yanti Malisons that had borne the palanquin take up their positions and they begin to lift it up. Fantaza slithers around, slides towards, kind of moves in an arc around a pillar, kind of keeping at a distance uh, from Rosnasi. And with that, kind of during this point, Berlinia, this is where you kind of catch that. There's this sideways look from Fantaza at um, Rosnasi, and you swear you catch just a glimmer of just a micro expression of an upturn of the corner of her mouth um an involuntary twitch almost to a smirk very well donala i hope that you and your friends will get to speak with me yet again as she makes a motion and begins to slide back out that corridor to the west. The four Malisons pick up the palanquin. Adesnia, unable to lift her head, barely able to move her arms, reaches out towards you, Dunala. Papa! Papa! Mayaka Bitu, and he's saying this in Shotan, it is okay. I will see you in your dreams. Papa is with you. Papa has always been with you. She continues to cry weakly, just saying over and over, Papa, Papa, until 
She is taken from the room and the doors close, leaving you with Rosna C now standing about probably about uh, 10 feet away from you. Um, there are still six Malisons flanking the room and the two brood guards holding the um, beholder orb at the back of the room. Donala, your daughter is now going to be continued to be taken care of. I am sick and tired of you talking about my daughter. Let's talk about you and me in the sea. You and me and Vale and Belinia and Kualu and our dear friend Aesorak. I'm sure you know that name. How do you know about Aesorak? And how do I not know? You definitely, you definitely catch him off guard. You see in his body language and expression the involuntary hiss You've just exposed his one of his aces up his sleeve, as it were. Um, he did not expect you to know this name. Well, let me put it like this. There's a soul monger in this city, be it a creature or a machine or a spell or a ritual. And it's what I put it here. And it makes sense that you would know this. And given the legends that I know of Aesorak and what I've been told about what he can and cannot do, which is very little, but also a lot, I'm pretty sure that an undead such as yourself, Raz Nasi, excuse me, Nasi, has much to fear. But that's neither here nor there. Veil. I'm just very smart. I'll nod my head. Well, we've been traveling together for a long... Oh, did we freeze again? God, I hope not. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Vale, we've been traveling together a long time, yes? Of course, yeah. You know that when I was more wanty than human, I was a person who was like to scheming, correct? So then, Vale, with that being said, it makes sense then that likely our friend here in the sea will betray us no matter what we do. We either defeat the soul monger and Aesorak and come out and he kills us, or we fail to do so and he fails to aid us, or something along those lines. Does that make sense, Vale? I mean, to see it from its progression, yeah. So then, Nasi, I believe it is the voice of Uta you should be talking to and not me, because he will make the decision on whether everyone in this city dies or just Aesorak dies. There's another, he doesn't hiss this time, but previously when you had mentioned Ubtau, uh, when you'd first encountered him um, in the underground river uh, and he had commented on your shifting from Yanti towards human uh, and you mentioned Ubtau, he had hissed in response to that. He flinches at the mention of Ubtau, but doesn't hiss. And you can see his eyes are flicking around and he's looking and he has that look of somebody as you're talking to Vale, he has this look of somebody that is rethinking something. And it's almost as if he didn't hear what you just said about talking to the voice of Ubtau other than the flinch. And he says, what, uh, what do you know of a Serac and what is this soul monger of which you speak? Tell me now. Dunala walking away will just sit down beside Vale and he will say, you claim to be in such a position of power and yet you are so ignorant of the things around you. It is a shame to see, but it explains why you've been wasting away in this jungle for so many hundreds of years. Um, Dunala. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw a, another domain at you guys because our good friend, what you're looking at has just subscribed for 16 months in a row. Um, I always make sure to call that out as Josh is our first subscriber and longest subscriber with, I think Megan right behind that, <laughs> uh, Marquise or rather Dunala. And there's another domain die. Skeleton Jr. has just dropped 500 bits. 
uh, in your favor. It's, it's almost as if people are sensing something might be coming up. <laughs> They sense that soon Dunala and this and everybody will need to kill a lot of people soon. What I want from you is um I'm gonna I'm gonna do it this way. Okay. Save versus death. It's a twenty-three. As Rosnasi lunges at you as you turn to walk away from him. But he doesn't lunge so he sort of suddenly like literally like a snake attacking. He throws his body forward. There's a sort of a whoosh, and uh Berlinia Vale and Qualu, you see as Rosnasi's tail whips around and sort of whoosh, right in front of your face. As it swings around Dunala, and um, Dunala, you will take. Kill uh, me. One. You will take ten points of bludgeoning damage. All right. As Rosnasi wraps his hand or his hand wraps his uh, serpent tail around you, constricting you. And Dunala. The, he pulls oh, you in that same motion. He pulls you toward, like, right up towards his face. He's risen up as high as he can so that he's towering over you. He's even sort of forcing you down a little bit. I am tired of your games, Dunala. You stand over top of me like you are in charge here. Dunala is laughing. He is laughing brazenly. And as he's brought basically to his, like, not his knees, because he's, like, constricted, but, you know, low enough that it makes no matter, he looks up, still smiling, spits just a little bit of, like, blood and spittle onto the cobblestones, and he says, for a dungeon master such as yourself, Lasnasi, your arrogance, your strength, your pomp is all so very frail, but if this is what you must resort to to regain power, I will give it to you. I will give you all the respect that you've so wanted these last few hundred years. So I will tell you about the Isarak. I know who Isarak is. I know what Isarak has told me and what he has put the yon tea toward and what you would have been a part of if I had not. Exiled you. But what you are telling me, if it is true, is that Serac has played me for a fool. What do you know of a Serac? And while Rosnasi has, in this moment, everybody. The uh, Vale Berlinia Qualu, the six Yanti Malisons have all sort of shifted their positions and taken up a um, kind of kind of like hovering between defensive offensive. If this were a uh, nineteen ninety Sega Mortal Kombat game, they're standing there like this, you know, in that stance, ready to fight but not not moving forward. Um, as be like Mortal Kombat 10, where I can like pick one up and hit somebody with it. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, Dunala, yeah, he's you. You've sort of raised in that little bit of uh, that little bit of uh, humanity that he clings to. Those emotions are surfacing as he's got you in his face. You can smell the rot of his flesh as this death curse is taking. Um, taking over his living body as he leans at you fangs just coated in saliva what do you know of a Serac and his true intentions and what is this soul monger Dunala's eyes are studying the face of Rosmasi and seeing this outburst of anger which is impossible for no one wants he to feel actually makes Dunala feel the tiniest shred of pity for this man. 
because he knows now that just as Dunala has months ago was claimed by Dendar finally, he knows that Nasi back in the day was likely claimed the same way. Once a human, once a bit, and now this thing. And seeing this almost like undead twisted mirror of himself, and seeing just how tormented and paranoid and afraid and angry he is, Durala just knows that he was close to going down the same path. And he opens his mouth and he says, it is hard to tell you these secrets, Rasnasi, when you are trying to break my ribs into my lungs. For a moment, uh, For a moment, uh, Rosnacy grips you tighter. It grows difficult to breathe. You feel not so much a cracking like things breaking, but you can feel your bones shifting a little bit as he tightens in anger. And then, actually, before anything other action takes place, what are the three of you? How are the are the three of you reacting to this? Qu- vale, go ahead. I've as soon as as soon as Rosnasi grabs Dunala, uh, weapons already out, and uh, and I'm I'm ready to uh, to basically fight. So I rapiers out. Uh, even though it probably doesn't work in the same way that it should be working. But because uh, stupid beholder thing. Speaking of which, actually, that's another thing. I would, I would probably be shifting between looking at that interaction and looking for this beholder eye thing that makes the magic go away. Mm-hmm. I would probably be looking for that and seeing if I could actually get to it and destroy it. So the beholder eye is, uh, let's see, 20 feet. I actually will say based on everything else, 15 feet behind you on the south wall, there's that alcove that has this uh, rune covered circle in the alcove. And on either side of that stands the two brood guards holding the staves that suspend the um, beholder eye up. Um, I will say, uh, just mechanically, um, as long as that beholder eye is active, none of your magic weapons work. All magic weapons are mundane um, during this point. And if you have, uh, if you're a spellcaster, which I think everybody but Qualu is, um, then you would have that that sensation that was described when you first felt it. And I, actually, I don't know if Vale and Berlinia had first we'd had that description, but you've had, this whole time. It's as if something that has always been there is suddenly gone. It's the absence of a thing. Um, kind of like if you know your entire life, you've heard your heartbeat in your own ear, and you've learned to just completely tune it out. Uh, it's like that. It's like your heartbeat is suddenly gone. Uh, something is missing. That's the the physical response you have to the... You're no longer connected to the weave. Um, it's as if a veil has been drawn between you and the weave of magic. Uh, but it is, yeah, about 15 feet directly behind you. Um, there's a... So you got these, these stone columns that are suspending the 20-foot vaulted ceiling. And they are about, uh, I believe, let me just double check the map. They are about 10 feet apart. So that's kind of a a little bit of an obstacle to move past if you were to attempt to do so. Um, So you're just kind of, you know, you're making the the visual assessment, Vale, not taking action. Basically, basically I'm trying to think of what would be the, the quickest and smartest way to destroy that beholder eye um and essentially just try and like make you know like kind of get everything back into get the ball back into our uh on onto our side of the field 
All right, Berlinia. How are you Berlinia reacting to all of this? Terrified. Uh, her eyes are just wide with fear and she is not really sure how to react. This feeling that she has of not this weird uh, disconnect that she is feeling right now is leaving her feeling just absolutely worthless. Uh, but I think she is still like looking to veil um, kind of like this just terrified, I have nothing, I can't do anything, I can't help anyone kind of look and is kind of frozen. And Kualu. As soon as the tail lunges and snaps Dunala and brings him forth and begins to crush him, um, Kualu steps forward, unsheathing his sword, and would like to attempt to sever his tail with the intent of freeing Dunala. I do not, I do not wish this to be a mortal wound, but definitely a maiming one. If Dunala sees him draw his sword, can I be like, yo, stop this? <laughs> That's up to Kualu if he actually heeds your... If, if you make a physical exclamation of don't touch my boy, then Kualu will kind of like half draw that sword in confusion. Um... Basically, like as you're like pulling up the sword, because Dunala knows the kind of man you, you basically become on your journey, he just shoots you a look, which you do recognize the look of stop. Mm -hmm. And so then I will glower and glare at Nasi um, with all of my half orcish fury, with <laughs> the facial the facial message of if you touch Dunala again, uh, that'll be the last time you have a tail. I would like. Uh, let's see here. Probably not going to matter. Uh, Vale and Berlinia, what's your passive wisdom or passive uh, perception? Eleven. That's a great question. Let's have a look. Oh, I'm twelve. Okay. Um, you notice Vale, particularly as you were sort of, you know, getting at the ready and looking around the room making an assessment, seeing where the beholder eye is. Uh, and Berlinia, just kind of in your helplessness, looking around, you both notice that the there's that hallway that extends about uh, 50 feet or so to the west that, you, that the, they, they bore um, Adesnia and the palanquin down that way through um, some doors. You see the door opened just a crack. And you see Fenthaza's face peering in to the situation. And she's looking with a grin. And she makes a motion to you, Berlinia, as she sticks her hand out. She holds a hand up to you, indicating. You see her flash five, ten, and then motions you this way. And then she kind of goes like this, as if to say, slowly. What do you do? Uh, she would look around the room quickly to see if anyone else had seen this. And you said that Vale had also, right? Seen yeah, that. Vale. You see this that sh that Fintaza is appears to be communicating with with hand gestures to Berlinia. And this is all happening very quickly as Rosna C is in that moment where he's grabbing Dunala and starts to, you know, they're having a bit of their verbal face off. Kualu starts to draw his sword like he's going to lunge at him and then it's kind of, you know, at odds, sword half drawn, wanting to attack. And it's just Vale and Berlinia. It's this sort of uh, quick moment that's happening. Uh, 
I think that she would look to Vil, but in spite of herself, she would end upon seeing this kind of weird uh, but subtle tension. She would take a, a very careful step uh, towards the door. Give me... Go ahead and make a stealth check. Um, obviously, Give me there's... a death saving throw. Yeah, make a death saving throw at disadvantage. And you can only roll a d10. Uh, Make I got a climb see. check. We're gonna go way back. <laughs> Mix it with diplomacy. Yeah. Roll use rope. <laughs> uh, all right. So what'd you get? Uh, Sixteen. Um, all right. One second. Uh, is all right. Oh, wow. Those are some low rules. Um, the Malisons are paying more on this side of the room. They're paying more attention to what's happening with Rosnasi and Dunala. Um, and in the same moment that they sort of step forward a couple steps towards the situation, you just sort of slide a few feet towards the door. And as you step almost 10 feet you feel that sudden rush as if a dam has broken and you feel the divine energies and arcane energies, uh, or I should say the arcane uh, celestial energies flow into you as you have managed to step just outside the effects of the beholder eye. And then you, I think you Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think she would look back uh, towards the door to see if uh, Melisandre. No, this isn't Game of Thrones. Nope. Ben Thousand. No, that is Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I did introduce the Iron Throne, but. <laughs> oh my goodness. Ben <laughs> There we go. <laughs> to see if she's still there. Uh, yes, yeah, she she is still there, and you hear <laughs> in your in your head you hear a voice, and it is Fenthaza's voice as she says, "Rasnisi cannot be trusted. Now is the time to strike. I will make it so. You will know when the time is right, when the eye is no longer affecting you." And it sort of cuts off as um, she runs out of the ability um, to, uh, you know, the, the message spell is limited to a certain number of words. Um, you would know that you, actually, I don't know if you would know. Have you used message at all? Okay. Yes, with the um, That's right. The hags. Yes. So you would know that you have the ability to respond back if you wish. She just responds with a quick, I will wait. Okay. And then you see, um, as the, um, the door slowly closes and she vanishes from sight. Now I was going to go back to the conversation with, uh, Rosna C and Dunala, but Dunala appears to have uh, stepped outside of the situation, lost in himself. Uh, vale, we'll go to you for a moment. Um, what what do you what what do you what? Good lord, what are you thinking? <laughs> uh, as you see Vale sort of nope, as you see Berlinia sort of sliding west, and then she seems to be sort of almost visually um, communicating with Fentaza. I would probably well first I would look a little bit a little bit oddly as to where she was going but um I would probably um I think seeing Berlinia going to kind of do her thing or at least try and like get some help <clears throat> I would probably try and create a distraction or something to make sure that none of the none of the Malthusons can 
see her. So, you know, maybe even stand in front or just kind of move or, you know, just kind of basically kind of block it. So, so she could do what she needed to do to help unimpeded. Okay. Uh, give me a stealth check. You're a stealth check. Whatever that means. Give me a stealth check. Call me a stealth check. Whatever. Hmm. Uh, that'll be a 23. Yeah, they don't see they don't see Jack. Uh, all right, so this is all happening in the space of just a, a, a moment, and it's kind of happening while Dunala and um, um, Rosnessy are engaged in this, as Rosnessy has just said to you, Dunala, tell me everything you know. Tell me what you know of Eserach and the Soulmonger. And he hasn't let you go completely, but he has loosened his grip on you. You ask for information, Nasi. Laz Nasi, I will give you that respect. You ask for information, but yet when I ask for information, you made me pay a price. I paid that price. Did I not? I have a few requests, and then I will tell you all that I know, and it is much. I can tell you that, Rasnasi, and they are simple requests. Uh, Fifteen. Mm. Okay. Continue. Now, Rasnasi, now that I have your true and earnest attention, and now that you're showing me what you really are, I will tell you what I know about Asarak and the soul monger. If you tell me what you know about Asarak, and if you do me one small favor. He just continues to glare at you. He doesn't answer. I know the type of man you are, Lazmasi. I may be becoming human again, but I was still a one team myself, yes. Still then, man, I know that likely you still plan to betray me in some way, shape, or form if I help you with this soulmonger and Asarax issues. There's no point in you lying to me. It is a foolish thing to do. I will assume so no matter what you say. I just ask you this, Raznasi, that no matter what happens, and I will go and I will destroy the soulmonger for you, that no matter what you do afterwards, you let my daughter be earnestly free. You do not sacrifice her. You do not perform any rituals on her. You send her back to Port Nianzaru. You give her guardians a good amount of money so they can live a good, happy, quaint life. And you leave her out of whatever story you have left to tell. You... Always so cocky. Always so confident. Do you know why I did what I did, Dunala? Do you know why you were ostracized? Do you know why you were removed from the favor of the oncoming Dendar, the Night Serpent? Because you were a constant threat. I can tell you this now. A labor worker who was turned into a wanty by your god, a threat? Or is this your power so weak, Razna, say that you had to destroy me who was busy lifting crakes on the docks? I have brought to you this deal with the plan not to betray you, as you say. If I were going to betray you, would I go through the trouble of keeping your daughter healthy and alive for now? It is the smartest thing to do to manipulate me, Lazmasi. If I were you, I would have done the same. But you are not me. You are the one in the grip of me, quite literally. Your daughter is in my possession. I have no intention of hurting her. I and my young tea have been guarding the tomb of the nine gods for a Serac. But I did not know that it was this this soul monger was in the very thing that the Serac had asked me to guard. Mm. 
Oh, yes, he put it there. He put it there, then he lied to you somehow with something, or maybe he forced you, I do not know, to make you got it. And inside of the tomb of the nine gods, which is sealed, as you, I'm sure you already know by the puzzle pieces, it's literally the end of this world. People die, they go to it. People resurrected, they go to it, as you know that well, too. Asalak has been using you to kill yourself. He has been making everything kill themselves. Do you know why I gathered the puzzle cubes? Why I fought against those insipid, that tiefling and these cult fanatics? Because I thought I was protecting Iserach's temple as he had asked us to, and that it would bring us closer to Dendar, the Night Serpent. But I see now he was using us. If what you say is true, Dunala, then you and your friends have the ability to go into this temple to find this soulmonger, destroy it, and end this curse. That is the plan, but now that we know that this is also in your interest, Lazna, see, some help would be greatly requested. Food, water, a day to rest. Berlinia and Vale. Uh, and Qualu. Actually, I'll have everybody do this. I want you to roll perception checks, but do not on Qualu, I want you to do so at disadvantage. As I'm going to roll for Rosna C at disadvantage. Uh oh, that's a 17 and an 18 at disadvantage. Um, so yeah, everybody's rolling perception. So I got a 14. I had an unnatural 20, but you know, I'm getting constricted over here, so I kind of can't right. see it. So All right, so you got a 14, Qualu? Six for me. Six? Okay. You don't see nothing. Uh, my highest roll between my two, if I had advantage, would have been a seven. Vale, what'd you get? <clears throat> I also got a 14. See, that's, uh... Actually, hang on a second. Wait a minute. Hold up. Wait a minute. No, I'm going to use, I'm going to use a, uh, I'm going to use a devil domain die. We got them, and I hardly ever use them. All right. So yeah. Uh, all right. Oh my god, I'm so happy I did that. Ah, uh, natural 19 on the die. Uh so that's 22. 21. 21. 21. And okay. Uh what about Berlinia? 13. Vale. Interestingly, you're the only one that notices this. As does with disadvantage, Rosna C got a 21, and you were trying to beat a 19. So, Vale, you hear from the south side of the room where you've seen the Beholder Eye being held by the Brood Guards. In that same moment, Dunala, you see Rosna C, his head flicks up. And he looks over your shoulder across the room. Vale and Rosna C both see the same thing at the same time, as Fenthaza has suddenly materialized on the teleportation circle that is in that alcove just behind the Beholder Eye. In a rapid motion, she reaches up, she grabs the Beholder Eye. Or rather grabs the uh, the chains that are suspended between the staves and yanks, pulling the beholder eye and both of the brood guards into the alcove with her. There's another and Fenthaza, the beholder eye, and the two brood guards vanish from sight. Vale, Dunala, Berlinia, all of you feel well, Berlinia, you already feel it because you were just outside of its effect. 
the rush of magical energy flow back into you. Dunala, for a moment, Rosnasi grips you uh, even tighter for just a moment as he releases you suddenly and cries out, Betrayer! What would, and this is specifically going to go to Vale first. Um, and then as we'll go to Berlinian next, because you sort of had a clue that something was going to happen. Um, then Dunala and Kualu. So Vale, what is your immediate reaction to what you see? Uh, well, <clears throat> I assume Rosna C yells that out, uh, and I'll turn around and say, no, it was a beholder. But, uh, but seriously, folks, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll probably, so the, the, are the, the two Malthusons. There's are, still six Malisons in the room with you. There's six Malisons. So I'd probably look at the Malice, like I'd probably be switching between looking at the Malisons and looking at Rosna C, uh, just to find out, just to gauge the room. But at this point, um, this very mundane rapier that I had, though it had a nice kind of motif, now suddenly starts growing what looks like these like silvered vines around it, and it just starts like becoming like uh, this. You know, the magic is just flowing back into it, so it's beginning to kind of grow and become this very organic looking weapon, like it was just pulled off of a vine somewhere, uh, in in Chult. So, I, I, I I said, as the rush of magic starts coming back to me, you know, I can start like hearing the heartbeat, but not my own. It's the heartbeat of Chult. I can begin hearing that beginning to like pound in my ears as, you know, I hear everything from the, the wind through the fronds to the animals uh, surviving in the jungle, but everything just, just rushes back into me and I feel more alive. You know, so I, I'm just nominate him for a point of inspiration because that was badass. I will grant that because that was badass. Taking the initial imagery I had given you and expanding on it in such a brilliant way, I love it. And uh, yeah, I will. Uh, and so yeah, like I said, I my sight, my senses are heightened. Uh, so I I am now kind of looking and also. Uh, from the detritus of the cavern and everything, and even uh, any like roots hanging down from underground uh, begins to kind of coalesce as Moyo kind of like comes in out of it uh, to my side. Nicely done. All right, Berlinia, you sort of had a sense that something was going to happen. Um, what is your reaction? It takes you a moment as everything's starting to to unravel, as it were, um, to then realize that the brood guards are gone. You didn't see Fenthaza appear um, and take them, but uh, you definitely see uh, that the brood guards and the Beholder Eye are no longer in the room. I think Berlinio wants immediately, as soon as she notices all of this and she sees the commotion going on, she wants to fire two Eldritch Blasts right at uh, Rosnacy. Okay, well, we're going to take a break and we're going to come <laughs> back from break rolling for initiative. Uh, as apparently your hand has been either forced or coerced or encouraged uh through an act of betrayal um so yeah we're gonna take a quick 10 minute break uh real quickly i do want to thank everybody who has joined us in the chat um we love seeing you guys there talking in the chat interacting thank you to uh those that have followed the channel since you got here um thank you to uh skellington jr for the 500 bits earlier buying the domain die uh, and of course, what you're looking at for the resubscription, um, and uh, even two socks, uh, two socks five cheered 100 bits earlier. Uh, so we thank you for that as well. We are going to take a quick 
10 minute break during which there will be some uh, announcements, but no worry. Uh, we'll see you back here in 10 minutes uh, with the conclusion of session 42, a den of vipers. And here we go. And we're back. At least that uh, bizarre stream interruption happened during the break this time. Um, just in case that does happen, stick around. Uh, you may or may not have to refresh. It might just kick in automatically. Uh, I didn't say this last time, but the good news is the recording is still running. Um, so I might do a little bit of editing and have us... Uh, I might not even edit it. They're not that long. Uh, but the VOD, which will be on YouTube soon, I'm going to get all these back up on YouTube, um, will be uninterrupted. So, okay. Right before the break, uh, surprisingly, Berlinia was the one who decided to initiate combat, uh, firing off two Eldritch Blasts. And I'm going to let Berlinia get that shot off at the top, regardless of initiative order. Um, and then we're going to immediately go into initiative order. So, um, we need to roll up some initiative. Um, I guess I could have done this during the break, but I was troubleshooting what was going on. So I've got a few things to roll for here. We've got the Rosnacy. Okay. And I'm going to split the Malisons. Um, there's basically a type one, two, and three um on each side of the room so there's a group of three on the left side of the room and a group of three on the right they're going to have two different initiative orders the left side gets Let's see left side gets a right and the right side okay veil what'd you get for initiative Okay, I rolled a 16, uh, 16 all in, and then uh, Moyo. I can't remember, excuse me, you all, the, yeah, and Moyo uh, rolled a 19. Moyo goes before me, what the hell? Hey, Berlinia. 10. Was that a 10? Mm hmm. What's your dex bonus? Plus four. Okay. Junala? 22. 22. Palu? 21. Okay. It's going to be... Junala is going to go first. Followed by Palu. Followed by... Moyo and Vale. Um, and then it's going to be there. And then there. And then Berlinia. And then this one. Okay. All right, Vale, first off, or no, not Vale, Berlinia, before we go into true initiative order, I want you to roll your two attacks versus um, Raza C, your two Eldritch Blasts. Okay. I got a 14 and a 17 to hit. Uh, 14 and a 17, you say? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's going to be a miss and a hit. Okay. Um... Okay, so that is going to do 12 points of force damage as well as push him back. Uh... So, yeah, the blast strikes Rosna C and he suddenly lunged back as you see these uh, arcane blasts strike Rosna C, Dunala. Um, sort of, I'm going to say. That his group, his group, his grip is loosened on you so that you will have advantage on an attempt to break free from his grapple uh, when your turn comes around, which is now because you're first in the in the initiative order. 
when that beholder eye is taken away, what hits do not all, all at once can be described as none other than an extremely intense psychedelic drug trip in the sense that the things he sees become geometric and covered in strange colors. He loses his balance for a second. His body feels uh, light and weightlessness. And then literally exploding from his arms where the scales once covered them are this black shadow. And these black shadows are taking the forms of rocks and eagles and flail snails and frog hemus and all nine of the nine gods and all the many predators of Schultz. And these shadows extend off of Dunala and then wrap around him like an aura, the shadow, the shadow of Utau himself. And he looks up to Ra's in the sea. And he's just grappled, right? He's not restrained or anything. Uh, you were restrained as part I of the grapple. Restrained. Now it's a grapple. Yeah, now it's it's just gotcha. a grapple. Okay, one second. Let me check my spells real quick. And he looks up to Rosna Sea, the shadows bursting from his body. And has Rosna Sea taken note of this power that's building up like in front of him? Um, you would see, since you're so close to him, you would see that uh Rosna Sea seems to also, as he kind of screams betrayal, um, you see this almost like a light in his eyes as his own powers, whatever they may be, have just rushed back into him. Perfect. Dunala then is reaffirming his belief that Rosna C is his twisted, broken, older mirror, his previous self and older life, maybe something like that. And that means that Utau, to Dunala has at least, has sent him here for the sole purpose of seeing this older version of himself destroyed, of overcoming it and bringing Chult to what it always should have been. And so he will turn the full power of his magic against Rosna C, and I will need him to make me a, a constitution saving throw. Yeah. A constitution saving throw? Yeah, I'm double checking. Oh, no, that's so it's, it's a contested strength check with my ability modifier against his strength. I'm casting telekinesis on him. Okay, so magical effect. Um, that is going to be a, it's his strength. Yeah, his strength versus my spellcasting ability, which I have to uh, find. There we go. His strength. This, let me just double check. That's going to be a total of 17. Perfect. So I got a 12 plus 9, so I have 21. Okay. And so what it looks like is the shadows of these predators that are bursting out of Dunala's arms literally all attack uh, Ra's and Sea at once. And they take the form of like panthers and commandons and other things. And they're biting his limbs and they're wrapping around him. And I'm going to use uh, the effect of telekinesis to basically just lift him upwards, like into the air by 30 feet. And so the take, ceiling and, is 20 and that feet. doesn't make me let go of him. Instead, I would use it to take his tail off of me. And he's still he's paralyzed, I think it is. The, the ceilings go about 20 feet up. I would basically take him as high as I can. Okay. And am I like on the ground or am I still wrapped in his tail? Um, that's a good question. Let's find out. Uh, you're still loosely held in his tail. Okay, in that case, since I haven't restrained, I would basically pull his tail off of me before I would lift him and that would end my turn. Okay, perfect. So yeah, using this, this telekinetic ability um you see him everybody sees him dragged towards the ceiling with these shadow panthers and and other creatures um pulling him up all the way to the 20 to the edge of the 20 foot vaulted ceiling and what condition is he under now he's restrained so as of the condition yeah and then Dunal would also shout to Kualu but talk to me while I do my work my friends and Kualu grunts and nods. And you're up next, Kualu. Kualu unsheathes this wicked-looking uh, meteor-born uh, greatsword with labyrinthine carvings in it. Um, and in this full glory, the sword uh, no longer held back by any kind of beholder eye. Um, it's some, some kind of brilliance about it. Uh, gives a sense of that it does not belong here in this world, and nor it ever should be here, but yet it exists nonetheless. And he stands guard over Dunalu, 
uh, looking over at the many uh, at the many Yanti that surround this place. He's going to hold his action to take the attack action if anyone dares strike Dunala, wherever that may be. Okay. Moyo is up next. And as a reminder for anybody who has not witnessed Moyo before, Moyo is Vale's celestial uh, find com- find uh, find steed, I believe it is, isn't it? Or is it find uh, was it yeah. find steed? It's find steed. Yeah, and it's a celestial um, commandant, which is sort of a a jaguar type creature with um, snakes. I think it's what, like six or seven snakes coming out of its shoulders. Essentially, it's like a Medusa Jaguar without the stone and more of the biting and the poison. There you go. Uh, it, and, so it's uh, Moyo's turn. I remember when you uh, when you gifted Moyo to me uh, that look of instant regret. It was it was <laughs> it was glorious. Like, it was what, classic. Why did I? Why did what? I give? What have I done? Horse sized Jaguar with snakes. Oh, that can put people to sleep. Don't forget that it's got the old sleep breath. Um, I just kind of point towards the Malisons, and uh, and Moyo's gonna kind of rush over. And seeing as how I never ever get to use this for Moyo, uh, I am gonna use its sleep breath. So it, all creatures in a thirty foot cone must make a con save or become unconscious for five minutes. And who are you targeting specifically? Um, as many of the Malisons that I can get in a 30-foot cone. So you'll have to target either the three on the left or the three on the right. All right, let's go with the three on the right. Okay, so that's going to be so a, a con D- save? Yeah, a DC 13 con save. All right, looks like they have a straight con rule, so... Got three of them, so I'm rolling three dice. Um, so that's a nine, a nine, and an eleven. Bam. So all three all right. of them have failed, and so they are now they become unconscious for five minutes, and the creature can only be roused by slapping them or inflicting damage to them. Also, uh, I'm going to roll a d6 to see whether or not this recharges again, and it's on a four to six. And I rolled a five. All so, right. And that's Moyo. Hmm. Okay. Uh, up next is Vale. Well, all right then. So, uh, seeing, seeing uh, uh, Rosna see being taken care of, three Malisons, half the Malisons are down. Uh, I'm going to rush so I can get kind of in between two of the Malisons and, uh, and I'm going to, going to hit him. I mean, what else does one do? Uh, so that's a 24 to hit. Yeah. Yeah. That hits. And uh, that'll be 10 points of magical piercing damage. Okay. And then I'm going to attack the another one that's within five feet. So I assume, well, I don't want to assume that they're all clumped together, but they're, are they? They're close enough that you can, you can string okay. your attack like this. Okay. And so I'll attack the next one for a nat 20. Nice. So as a reminder... Uh, Crits in an MTD game are automatic max damage, including dice and modifiers. Then roll any damage dice once more and add that number. Uh, so it's fifteen plus, uh, well, plus three, so eighteen points of magical piercing damage. That was to a different one. Okay. That was to a different one. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, that's me. All right. So, with this telekinesis spell, does Rosnasi get another saving throw at the end of his turn? I just looked at it, and what it is is that I have to use uh, an action on my turn next turn. I think it is. I'll double check it to keep the spell on him, so he doesn't get a save. It's just another contest. Okay. Next time. Okay, I got it. So, let me just 
see here. And he's only 20 feet in the air above you as he begins spitting in that combination of abyssal and draconic and you hear him cursing you by the name of Dendar and he's screaming at you Dunala I was a fool to ever think I could trust you I will rip you apart myself and as he's speaking you see even though he's straining against these um telekinetic uh force that's holding him up at the top he's able to sort of twist and writhe a little bit and you can you recognize that he is casting a spell and i need you to make a constitution saving throw dunala always with the spells when he's want why can't people just be paralyzed and be quiet for a bit? Uh, let me look at my con Oh, I forgot to touch that, don't I? Ooh, that's nice. That's a 7 plus 12, so, what, 19? It's a 19, and you are saving against... Hold on. <clears throat> Power word kill. Uh, so you rolled a 19. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I need to check the if there's a half damage on the... You would know. What spell is it? Blight? Yep. Half as much. So you will, yes, he was casting Blight on you. As is tradition. Ooh, wait a second. Ah, oh, wait, never mind. I mean, I, I have that ring of spell turning, so I don't know if this would work on that. I think I need a natural 20 on it, so never mind. Um, okay. Oh, here it is. Stupid okay, answer, right? so you're going to take half of, uh, let's see, that's 10... 22, 32, 39, 40. So you'll take 20 points of necrotic damage. So I have a question, and I just, well, never mind. It's too late. My ring of spell turning gives me advantage on it, and I rolled, and but it's, never mind. Yeah, you would have had to call that a little sooner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so... Uh, that, How much damage was it? Uh, 20. Uh, it was 40 halved to 20. Um, and it's almost as his words are uh, taking... Th- they seem to almost be drawing from the same uh, part of the weave that you're casting. Is It seems like he's pulling the shadow from these shadow jaguars and other things, and it's sort of coalescing and dripping down uh, and forming this sort of poisonous energy um, this necrotic energy, rather, uh, and you are able to resist a lot of it. Even though Junala resists a lot of it, uh, he fails his concentration check, and the shadows are blown away that he summoned that kept Roz and Sea there, which would mean he'd be fine. Oh shit! Um, <laughs> uh, let me check something real quick. Uh, of course, Roz and Sea doesn't have feather fall. Why would he? Uh, okay, so Roz and Sea is going to fall twenty feet. Uh to the ground um hmm. yep he's gonna fall 20 feet to the ground uh so he's gonna take eight points of bludgeoning damage as he hits the ground um and sort of lands in a in a mess and i'm gonna say yeah he uh is essentially prone um, I don't think he's, resi- or yeah, he's not immune to prone. So yeah, he basically falls in a sprawling heap on the ground at your feet. Um, oh, it is the left side Malisons. The two that attacked, um, or were attacked by Vale are going to attack Vale back. And... The first one is going to make two scimitar attacks versus you, Vale. The first one is a 13, which I believe misses your armor class. Um, And the second one is a nat 20. That is a critical hit versus Vale. Well, the 13 does miss. Um, 
but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's going to be an automatic nine points of damage plus five. So you take 14 from that second one. It's almost like he feigns with the first one and lures you into uh, sort of dodging right into his second blow. Cuts into your side and does that thing where it kind of like hits and then he pulls it forward, slicing, slashing along your side. The second uh, Malison um, is the uh, the one that you attacked. It's the Type 2 Malison, the one that has the arms that are snakes. And both of his snake arms are going to attempt to bite you. The first one is going to miss with a 12. Um, but the second one sort of comes over top of it as it's the second one is receding. Uh, and they, he does this weird thing where his arms sort of get twisted up, um, and b accidentally blocks himself because that was a three on the die. Um, so that one's attack fails. The third one, which is a type three Malison is the one that has the, um, snake like body is going to lunge at Berlinia who is nearest to it. Uh, Oh man, that is a 10 to hit as it lashes at you with its tail uh, in a similar fashion that Roz and the Sea did to Dunala. Um, it fails to do so uh, to a, to successfully hit you. Uh, and Berlinia, it is your turn. So Berlinia is going to turn quickly um, towards... Um, Dunala, actually, and uh, she stretches out her hands, and you see this just ethereal light shine from her hands. And you, Dunala, you feel like this warmth coming over you, and uh, she is going to heal you for 12 points. And then she's going to turn right back around and hit this um, Malison uh, with uh, two of her Eldritch Blasts. All right. And that's a those, 28. Those, a because it's engaged with you, uh, those would be at disadvantage. Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be... Uh, an 18 and a 10 to hit. The 18 will hit. That's going to do 10 points of force damage. And also push it back 10 feet. It gets slammed up against the wall just to the side of that long hallway uh, that's off to your left. As you make this attack, you hear a sound you'd almost forgotten. It's almost as if the DM forgot that she was there as <laughs> yes, I did out of the corner of my eye, catch the side chat and realized I had totally forgotten about copper bell, the tabaxi hunter, uh, that was a part of this. Um, but she has just been there waiting for the right moment. And that moment seems to be as Rosna C has hit the ground and she comes charging in like a blur and you see as she has her short sword drawn, she's going to rush. And with, with uh, Rosna C prone, these attacks will have advantage. Um, that's going to be a 16 and a 16 to hit. And Rosna C has an armor class of... That's enough to hit. Both of them will hit Rosna C. Uh, so each of those short swords does 1d6 plus 3. So that's 12 points of damage to Rosna C as she comes charging right up on top of him and just takes a couple big slashes at his prone form. Um... The Malisons that are asleep, they're just asleep unless they get hit, correct? Or woken up. There's no kind of save or anything like that. So That's correct, yeah. So um, they're they're unconscious for five minutes or uh uh 
what the heck would that be? 60 rounds? <laughs> yeah, 50 rounds, I think. 50 rounds, okay. Mm. So, they continue to sleep. Uh, that is going to bring us all the way back to the top of the initiative order with Dunala. Rosna C is prone at your feet. Dunala is absolutely almost wasted by this blight spell that rushes over him. He recognizes the spell because he recognizes the damage. And as he coughs up blood, he lowers his shaking hand. And if I think Vale would notice this, given he's fighting like right beside Moyo. Vale, you see that Moyo's shadow gets longer and longer. And then the shadow literally steps off of the ground and begins to sprint directly straight at uh, Rosnacy. And this is me using my bonus action to conjure forth my Hound of Ill Omen, which has the stats of a direwolf, can only attack Rosnacy, is size medium instead of large, and has four temporary hit points. And within, when it's within four feet of Rosnacy, sorry, five feet, I mean, excuse me, he has disadvantage on spell saving throws. Is, it a, is it a spell? It's not a spell. It is a, a sorcerer class feature. Okay. Yep. So it's so, basically just charging in on him to impose yeah. disadvantage on what? I roll initiative for it, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Unless you just want it to go after me, so I guess that's up to you. You can roll initiative if you wish. All right. One second here. So, wait, what would the point be? I just had the die wolf pulled up. Sorry. But, oh, there it is. All right, so I rolled a three plus two, so it's five initiative. Um, it's going to land beside him, and as it does so, Dunala is taking his right hand and thrusting it at Rosna C, and it's the hand that has his ring on it. And you see the ring of spell turning kind of glow black for a second, absorbing light. And then he's channeling that same blight that was pumped into him directly back into Rosna C. You know, disadvantage on the saving throw, and I'm casting it as a fifth level spell. A fifth level spell. Yep. My save my spell save DC is 17. Uh so first he is going to attempt to counter spell this spell. All right. Uh so that is a fifth level, so the DC is 15. Uh -huh. Um I'm gonna use this new die that Lydia from Castle Mac sent me. Um that is a fifteen on the die. The spell uh, ring will flash again as I use a domain dice to make you reroll that. <laughs> all right. Excellent use of domain dice as we take that one away. Whoa, whoa. Are you freaking kidding <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> like that Don't die just jumped unless off. Unless you're a one. <laughs> that die just left. Like, nope. Um, you know what? I'm going to switch it up and use this uh, larger Kraken die I have, oh, shit. which I probably shouldn't have done. Uh, so let's see the counter spell DC. When you're rolling counter spell, it's just a straight roll, isn't it? Uh, I think you or can do add you roll your spell. Check. Yeah. You roll your spell casting modifier. Yeah. Yep. That's a 15. That's an eight on the die plus seven for his spell right. casting modifier. So then he is going to take a total. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, it cost you two domain die to make me re-roll. All right. So he takes half of 52, so 26 Ooh. points of necrotic damage. Nice. And Dunal will also, he's going to fall back and put, like, Qualu in between him and Rousnessy. <laughs> you got this, my friend. All right. Uh, and with the initiative you rolled for your... Uh, um. Hound of Ill Omen. Your is hound, yeah, I wrote Hell. I wrote Hellhound because I couldn't remember what you said. But uh, it is last in the initiative order with that five. Ah. Um, so that was Dunala Kualu. You are up now. Interposed between. As Dunala steps away, this is basically um, him giving permission to run my sword through. Uh, as I brandish my sword onto the prone form of this crippled, dying Yanti as I hack at him twice, um, seeing how that happens. So he's prone, correct? Uh, From the fall? Yes, he's still prone. It hasn't been his turn yet. And That's I already awesome. burned a reaction to Counterspell. So have at it. All right. That's going to be a crit on one of them. All right. 
I would like to spend a dome. Oh, I can't. And then that'll be a 20 on the second attack. Okay, so those are both going to hit. All right. So uh, crit is going to do 13 plus 12. 13 plus 20 says 33 on the crit. And then, uh, ooh, max damage on the second attack, uh, 20. So that's 53 points of damage. Good God. Uh, is it? Is he still uh, alive? Yeah, he's still up. Yeah, I'm gonna burn my action surge. Do this again. All right. That is gonna be a 19 and a 28 to hit. Those are both gonna hit. All right. And that's gonna be. Oh, I get to reroll that because of my weapon style. All right, that's going to be 5, 13, 8, 21, 29 more damage between the two strikes. Uh, okay, 29, you say? Yep, 29 and 53 for a grand total of 82 damage this round. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I think it's in here. I still have a bonus action left. So what are you going to do with that bonus action? Uh, spin in his face. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a... I don't know where it went. I have a die that has uh, body parts on it. Oh, um, so I have, I, sorry, I have, I have a half-orc uh, savage attack, so I get an extra die on the critical attack. Oh. We've got to factor that in. Um... So that'll be an extra, ooh, another nine points of damage. Uh, so 20 levels in Barbarian, so I get two more dice for the crit. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, how much more damage was that? An extra, an extra nine. An extra nine more. So that's 91 in total. This turn. Um, during the course of your attack, he's already in this state where he was withering from the... Uh, from the death curse and from his position on the ground he is slashing around thrashing trying to block you um he you end up severing his right arm uh just above the elbow um like your last blow just comes down and hits concrete or hits stone and there's a brief spark and a spray of blood as you sever his arm um which i don't know how long he's going to last but i'm going to say that that's also going to cause him problems with casting somatic spell components so uh I hesitate to ask, but is that all? Yeah, that, that's all. I don't have any reason. I, I mean, <laughs> unless you would allow a bonus action offhand attack, which is me stomping in his face uh, with my boot, then otherwise, no. You used your two attacks, and then you action surge and used two more attacks. A unarmed strike as a bonus action, uh, I would allow. Oh, hell yeah. Make him bite the curb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's this is, what be... is that, American History X? Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be another crit. So Connor, I'm not even going to make you roll. Okay, well, I'm just going to add it up. So <laughs> he, just, damage, he just wants to know so how much damage, damage he did. It's six, but then another six on that on top of that is 12, and then Savage Attacks gives me another two, so that's 14 damage for my stomp that is that that's without rolling the extra damage so i don't have to i don't i don't get to roll any dice because it's one plus strength mod um okay yeah well at the point that you were making this uh extra curb stomp he only had eight hit points left awesome because you did a grand total of like 90 some points over you did like 100 points of damage um so I'll stand there. This his round, skull so, crushed between underneath my boot, 
his eye and brain viscera just, just painting the floor. And I'll look at you, Dunala. And then I'll roar to the rest, to the, rest of the, uh, the Yanti. That's my turn. I imagine it is a very primal orcish roar as Kualu has basically dismembered uh, with this with these savage attacks, Kualu has dismembered um, Rosnasi. Uh, it is a bloody, gory mess. Um, so, following that up, what would Moyo do? There's still three active Malisons in this room. I'm thinking that so after the three go down uh moyo's are moyo's gonna take uh, a running leap she's gonna like kind of leap over and attack um just straight up attack uh, a couple of malisons so actually the two that attacked me so she's gonna go after so she's gonna go after one so i think it's uh one bite and two claw attacks um she attacks the first one uh, that is a 14 to hit. That will hit. Okay. And she does uh, seven points of slashing damage. She comes like right over with a claw attack. All right. Uh, and then she'll go and attack the next one with a bite. Uh, and that is also a 14. Yep, another hit. And unfortunately, this one's not as powerful. It's only uh, three points of piercing damage. Okay. And then you follow it, Vale. Yeah, and then as, as, as she kind of like bites down uh, into the second one, I'm attacking that very one. Um, and that'll be a 16 to hit. Uh, uh, what number? 16. Yeah. Uh, and that'll be, let me just go, got to double check here. Uh, that will be 14 points of magical piercing damage on the one. All right. And then, uh, the second one, again, that I, like, basically I'm going at the two that I attacked before. Uh, that's going to be a 17 to hit. Yep. And that's going to be another 10 points of piercing damage. Okay. They're still standing, but they are turning into a bloody mess. All right. And that's me. Um, and this is the point where you hear... And all of you feel an almost... Well, all of you except Kualu feel an almost fatiguing... Uh, jerk as your magical essence is once again instantly stripped away just blocked uh it's very jarring but you don't suffer any kind of mechanical or rather uh you know no exhaustion or anything like that but it is very jarring um you also hear the doors at the end of the hall slam open and you hear do, 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 feet on the ground as uh, almost two dozen Yanti brood guards and Malisons bearing weapons come marching into the room and begin flanking around all of you. The uh, at the back of the chamber is the source of the absence of your magical connection as the beholder eye has once again reappeared with Fenthaza by two different brood guards. These ones stand out most notably as being uh, shrouded in yellow robes matching Fenthaza's yellow uh, robes and gown that she wears over her human humanoid form of her body. The additional yon tea that come into the room 
they quickly seize the Malisons that are bloodied that you are fighting with, Vale, Berlinia, Moyo, and slit their throats. They, the ones that go around the southern edge of the room come around to the three Malisons that are sleeping on the ground and drive spears and yaklas right through their heads into the ground, killing them. Benthaza moves around the two brood guards so that she is standing just to their side. And they begin to move around the edge of the room. As she circuits around to the right edge of the room, slowly, the whole time they're moving to keep this eye aimed at the four of you. Benthaza shifts all the way around the room, her gaze flicking to the dead body of Rosnasi. Until she's at the northern edge of the room, where she kicks away the end of Rosnasi's tail uh, that had been severed in Kualu's ravaging attacks. It thumps down the dais. And she seats herself, slithering into this Iron Hydra throne, settling both hands on its arms. The brood guards and the um and the uh beholder eye are positioned in front of her towards all of you. You will pardon my continued use of this well, incredible artifacts. As I just want to ensure in your bloodlust that you do not lash out at me. Very well done. You made very short work of that. I congratulate you. You see, this was your... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I see this was your plan all along, then, to use us to help you seize power. It was... A possibility that I had hoped would bring itself to bear. And very quickly, I could see things turning in my favor. Dunala wanted Rosnesi to be dead. I wanted Rosnesi to be dead. We had a mutual goal. I merely presented you with the catalyst so that Dunala could... Uh, Fulfill his desire. What I now want. Up, you... oh, go ahead. Sorry. So now that you've gotten what you've wanted, are you going to turn on us like Rosna C would have, or are we free to go? There are certain aspects of Rasnasi's deal, which I was in agreement. There were things that I was not in agreement. You will be allowed to go, but I would ask that you continue the mission of which Rasnasi, in his ignorance, was requesting that you would uh, follow through on. I would like you to take out the soul monger. It can only benefit all of us. Particularly Dunala and his daughter. Dunala, you are uncharacteristically quiet. Dunala, whose heart is beating out of his chest, has been staring at Roz in the sea and feeling a sadness that is hard to describe. There's a sadness that comes when you see someone that, even if it didn't mean anything positive, meant a lot to you being destroyed. It's like having a purpose taken away from you for why you live. And when he looks at Roz in the sea, 
and he sees the man that Rothensee is, and he sees the mirror of himself, he thinks in the back of his mind that he wishes, he wishes he would have been born hundreds of years ago and chosen by Ubtal then to save Rothensee. But those kinds of conflicting and strange and human emotions are put away when he looks up and he sees Tentaza looming above him. And he says, I do not believe that Rasnasi would have betrayed me. But you, Tentaza, you are much like your sister, I see. Do not accuse me of being like Salida. She was small and petty and did not have the ability to proceed in the way that I have. She did not. That is why I killed her. And you do. And that is why I should kill you. But you have my daughter. And more importantly, you have this thing. And he points to the beholder's eye. This is what I call insurance. Knowing how rash you are in your decisions. I want to make sure you are not going to make your ass decision against me and my new regime. Here's what I want you to do. First, and she makes a motion, and a couple of brood guards come in carrying a... Uh, between the two of them, they're carrying a chest. And in this chest, they place it at the feet... at her feet, or her feet, at, at the foot of the throne... Um, and they open it and inside are five puzzle cubes. This is all of the puzzle cubes that the Yonti were able to procure from the temples, as well as the ones, or I believe only one that you hold, you now have in your possession. Six of the nine puzzle cubes needed to enter the tomb. And I know where the other three are. She looks over at Berlinia. The weeping friars have them. And I know where they are. All you need to do is get the last three from them. Go into the tomb of the nine gods. Find the soul manga. Destroy it. And while you are there, I would like you to look for something for me. It is a... of the many treasures you are sure to potentially find within the tomb. It is a bauble. A trinket. But it is something that I would like. Donala, when you place this trinket, this black opal crown in my hand, I will place your daughter's hand in yours. And you will be free to take her away from here. That is it. There is no more to it. You will leave this place when you are finished, and you will leave the Yonti to their own machinations. Kualu turns to you, Dunala, after having wiped his bloodied sword upon the tattered garments of the, the now battered and ravaged and ruined corpse of Nasi. Um, he's looking at you to see if these terms seem agreeable, because they do to Kualu. When you look at Dunala, you see your best friend is tired. He is very tired. His robes are frayed from when the spell washed over him. His face is gaunt, and without his magic, any confidence, any swagger he might normally have is almost completely gone. But more importantly, you see that he makes a face that you, Kualu, have seen a lot on your journey through Kjolt. 
And that's the face of people who resign themselves to death. People who know that soon they will die no matter what they will do for what is their destiny. And Donato looks at you and then he looks over at Vale and Berlinia and he thinks something very specific that I will not share now. And then he looks up to Thintaza and he says, it's their decision, not just mine. She slowly turns her head to regard the rest of you. Well, what is your decision? I would remind you, your alternative, well, it won't be nice. Well, then it would appear that we don't have a decision, really. I see in front of me a being that has helped us. In return, we will help. At least Kualu will. I think Berlinia would turn away um, instead towards uh, Danala. We'll get your daughter back. And just nods as if this is um, the, I guess the best thing to do is just to go along. Vale. Vale just kind of stands and um, just stares for a while. And then finally, uh, just I open my mouth just ever so slightly and say, as long as you keep your end of the bargain, then. Yeah, I guess we are going to have to deal. And then you hear another voice. Well, it is not... It is not as if anybody has asked what I was thinking about it, but, um, you know, it appears that if I stick with the, the four of you, I am certain to have a glorious death. I will join you, says Copper Bell. Fantaza looks out at all of you and says, Very well. Then all you have to do is get the three cubes from the fires. I wish you all the luck that your gods will afford you. And that is where we are going to end tonight's session. Wow. Wasn't sure how that was going to go down. <laughs> Berlinia had some coal in it tonight. I was like, yeah. Know, fuck. <laughs> there were so many things. I was telling telling Megan at the break uh, while we were waiting for everybody else to show up. This is one of those unique, and I know Marquise, uh, you're, I think, the only one other than me that's familiar with some of the internal stuff. So there's a lot that's. I, the whole Fane of the Night Serpent with the Yon T is pretty much an, an adventure unto itself. Um, and there's a lot going on in there and a lot of, uh, politicking and power struggle going on. And I kept that in mind the whole time things were happening over the last several sessions. And it was one of those things I alluded to when we played a month ago, I have to have so many things ready because there's, it's, it's, there's so many facets to this that from moment to moment, your decisions were shaping what potentials could happen and it was your actions that created the opening for Fentaza to uh, make a play so that was really exciting to see how that unfolded um and to see if you guys were going to take on Fentaza and two dozen uh malisons and brood guards um Dunala, how bad did uh Rosnacy's blight hurt you I was down at eight hit points, so Dunala was very close to going out with a very sad bang. So that would have sucked if you hadn't saved against that, because that would have oh. been 
The sad thing is, I remember that I had my ring of spell turning, and it gave me advantage. And when I re-rolled it, I rolled a 20, which would have reflected the spell back at him, but it was too late to bring it up. I was like, shit, that would have been so helpful. Yeah, Rosna C has the potential to be a very powerful um, a very powerful individual, but uh, when you encountered him, uh, I mean, you got four ninth levels facing off against this this guy who's already in a weakened state, and um, he, he can't counterspell a sword. Nope. No, the only thing I had potential that I was looking at was uh, you were rolling high enough that it wouldn't have mattered, um, but the only other reaction he had was uh, shield, uh, which would have bumped him up to like a 20 AC. Um, so yeah, you guys are now closer than ever to the titular um tomb of annihilation uh do we also get a level up no you don't get a level up you just leveled up a couple sessions ago just because it's been just because it's been a month in real time (laughs) since we played okay okay you're right but can we get two level ups no damn what did i do what did i tell you guys like six months ago i estimated that you guys would probably be around level eight or nine when you hit the actual tomb. And I just want a six level spells so I can fuck something up with them. I just want to fuck somebody up with a six level fireball. That's all there is to it. I can't wait to see uh, as you guys close in. And you know, at least you know what you're exactly who you're going up against next to get those last three puzzle cubes. Uh, so we'll see how this is all going to gonna work out oh yeah that's right quality wanted to add one more term to the agreement but maybe we'll wait till next session all right so um yeah we'll we'll have some discussion in between now and our next session which is most likely gonna be next week uh we may potentially have to put one of the players on autopilot or rather one of the characters on autopilot a little bit um i i was hoping we'd get a resolution here because i did not want to have to there's no way we could have autopiloted Dunala through a confrontation with uh, with Rosna C. So, um, yeah, so we will be back here next Sunday night, most likely. You've got to be kidding me. It just disconnected again. Did I lose everybody? Can you guys hear me? Son You're good of, now. Son of a... It just disconnected again. I don't oh, know wow. what's happening. I just... Well, we'll just, just call it. I mean, you're pretty much saying, join us next time. Well, well drilling. give us a big old much ado. Uh, it looks like we are back, actually. All right. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. We just decided to have well, a maybe not. come out. Maybe not, because it just went... Nope. Oh. Yeah? Oh. Huh? Oh. 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 Oh, that's that's poopy. Hold on, I don't know what's happening because we we might <clears> actually <throat> still be on because it just went off and on again. So hold on one second. I don't want to be oh. you know weird. Okay, this yep. is really weird. <laughs> so it, it cut out at the end, and I was frozen again. I think we're back. Yep. Agent Kevin says we're back. Okay. I'll have to troubleshoot tomorrow. The good news is tomorrow is an American holiday, so I can do some troubleshooting during the day. Uh, Because, as I was about to say, we will be back here next Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, most likely, for episode 43, um, yet to be titled. Um, And then tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern uh, is All That Glitters, our Waterdeep Dragon Heist campaign, dungeon mastered by this fella, right here along with myself and megan dwight the big bearded nerd and cassie from porch pottery florida um and then on thursday we return with uh with our what is i don't remember what session we're on now 15 i think of um dawnbringers the forge of fury uh, and they are closing in on the finale of that season as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's something going on this Tuesday, Megan, is there not? Um, Tuesday night, yes. I will be on 
Dice on Ice YouTube channel, um, along with Megan as the Dungeon Master and Connor as one of the players, and a couple other fantastic players as Megan is taking us through Curse of Strahd. Um, yeah, so we're getting right back into it. Uh, lots of RP going on, role-playing games, D&D. Uh, be sure to tune in on Tuesday night to Dice on Ice. Everybody's socials are down in the information bar on the YouTube video, or you can type in their name, Mike, Megan, Marquise, or Connor, I believe. I believe that's set up. You can set in their names and uh, in the chat, and their socials will come up. Apparently, Megan, we still don't have Berlinia's information in there, and I don't know why. So uh, we'll figure that out as well. In the meantime, remember um, that uh, you are, that you matter. You, you, we love you. You genuinely matter. If you find yourself in a position where you need somebody to talk to because things are, are looking dark, you can call the National Suicide Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255 or text 741-741. Trained professionals man those lines and are waiting to talk to you if you need to. Uh, you can also um, uh, you can check out the link to Jasper uh, Jasper's Game Day. Uh, Jasper's Game Day is an organization dedicated to the awareness and prevention of suicide. Um, and finally, uh, just remember our partner, um, Initiative Coffee Company, uh, we have created a Meta de Rose coffee that every bag that's purchased, $3 goes to Jasper's Game Day to help fund suicide crisis centers. In the meantime, we're going to get out of here. And we will see you hopefully tomorrow night joining us for Waterdeep. We're going to go ahead and end the stream the same way we end every stream. And you can say it with me if you want. Hmm. <laughs>